name is Virginia Hall, and I'm here to introduce you to Roger Rule, author of The Rifleman's Rifle, and host of this series of episodes, Special Guns with Roger Rule. Thank you, Virginia. Welcome. Welcome, viewers, to my fourth episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. <clears throat> Roger, let me ask you first, what is your definition of special guns? For this series, special guns are simply guns that uh, a gun enthusiast may have heard of but never encountered. And I narrow my focus to those arms that hold an evolutionary or revolutionary place in the world of modern sporting arms over the last two centuries and have since become sort of classics because of it. <clears throat> so what do we have today? Uh, the gun I want to cover today logically follows from the last episode. That rifle was a Magnum Mauser bolt-action rifle in 416 Rigby specifically designed for big and dangerous game. This rifle today takes it one step further. It's a big bore double rifle, and according to many, it's the creme de la creme for African hunting, or even big brown grizzly or Kodiak bears in this hemisphere. <clears throat> in, in the book, The Great Guns, by Harold L. Peterson and Robert Ellman, the authors uh, reserve a chapter for these rifles, uh, their chapter 18, entitled The Most Dangerous Game. I want to read you a couple of excerpts from the opening page of that chapter. And I'm quoting here, The large dangerous game animal animals of Africa and India have tantalized sportsmen as well as countless professional hide and ivory hunters for centuries. Hunting can be extremely hazardous in the forests, thick brush, and jungles where certain beasts are found. Yet the pursuit of such game was relentless for years until shooting pressure was finally subdued as a result of governmental regulations, high safari costs, and the decline of game populations caused by poachers. Unlike the, these factors, danger was not a deterrent to a hunter the greatest prize was worth the greatest peril, close quote. <clears throat> Before our modern ammunition, early big bore rifles were undependable. They were not accurate or powerful enough to uh, guarantee kills at what might be called a safe range. According to the authors I just cited, and I want to quote a passage again that pertains to that, the solution was to shoot at an unsafe range stopping an animal in time to avoid being gored, flung, or trampled. By the early 1800s, definite theories had evolved, especially among the English, about firearms of this work. Close quote. <clears throat> this gets back to when the British controlled India and most of Africa in the heyday of uh, safari hunting. The double rifle emerged... Uh, for that purpose, and the shooter could ha uh, have the gun ready to fire both barrels, follow the first shot with a quick second shot, or even fire both barrels at once, if necessary. The early rifles had two separate locks uh, with exposed hammers. Later, when hammerless shotguns were invented, the hammers were, were removed from the double rifles as well, but two locks were still popular because if a hunter were out in the bush or jungle and one lock broke, <clears throat> the gun was still serviceable with the other lock uh, st still working. And uh, we'll cover side locks and box locks in very much detail in later episodes. Those concepts are beyond the scope of this episode today. <clears throat> but back to the classical hunter of the day, since they had gun bearers, Another popular form of insurance for uh, gun failure was to have two rifles of this type. With all four barrels available and a fast handoff from a gun bearer, the experienced hunter could dispatch four of the big thunderous rounds quickly to avoid getting trampled by a charging elephant. For the rifle with side locks, often the maker would make a second set of locks for the hunter to take into the wild country where no gunsmith was available. A second set of locks was cheap insurance for a problem that might spoil a, an entire safari with a phenomenal wasted cost. One other point, the change from rifles with hammers to rifles without hammers was slow to catch on for some hunters <clears throat> as there were books uh, and articles written by professional hunters that claimed they wanted to see those hammers cocked 
when the rifle was ready for action rather than rely on their memory or rely on the cocking indicators that may or may not be functioning. Even well into the 20th century, uh, gun makers were still making the big dangerous double rifles with actions with exposed hammers. So these were basically elephant guns? Um, Is this why we have that little elephant figurine <laughs> over there? That elephant figurine was a complimentary gift from a U.S. serviceman stationed in Djibouti. Uh, he sent me a copy of the rifleman's rifle to sign, and with it he sent that elephant as a complimentary <laughs> gift. It's a wood hand carving from Djibouti, and it fits our theme here today because, to answer your first question, rifles uh, like this are usually called elephant guns. However, they are popular for any large, especially dangerous animal that might charge the hunter rather than turn tail and run. Uh, the refinements of these big devils came quickly during the second half of the 19th century. Outstanding big game devils for mammoth-sized cartridges were made by English makers such as Greener, Gibbs, Grant, Holland, Holland, Purdy, Rigby, and many others. The actions of those early guns unlocked with a Jones underlever under the trigger guard and then broke down like a conventional double-barreled shotgun of today. Later ones used the top tang lever, a development uh, of WNC Scott & Son, which is common to most double guns today, both side-by-sides and over and unders. So this maker is a French maker? Yes, the maker's name is Chapuis. It has a history of the gun maker. We don't have much on Shop we were told the company started in 1935, but they didn't export into the U.S. markets until the tail end of the 20th century. If you wish to check them out, though, they have a website, uh, www.chapuis-arms.com. Chapuis is spelled C-H-A-P-U-I-S, and they use the French spelling of arms, A-R-M-E-S. However, the website is in French, and although I cannot translate just looking it over, I don't believe a history is included. One of their U.S. distributors, William Larkin Moore, writes that they are a well-known French firm, and they're located on the hills overlooking, <clears throat> overlooking uh, Saint-Étienne, France. We know that Saint-Étienne is the pantheon of the best French gunmakers like London is, uh, to Great Britain. The distributor goes on to say that the company makes no compromises in their manufacturing process, where every detail is painstakingly taken into account. From the selection and quality of wood, the magnificent detailing and engraving of the actions, to the labor-intensive regulation of the barrels. Nothing's left to chance. They add, and I quote, their guns are entirely manufactured in their own facility and are fitted and finished by hand in the old world methods passed down by uh, generation to generation, close quote. That was uh, from William Larkin Moore. The wood for their stocks comes from centuries old walnut trees that are from the Caucasus Mountains area. I had to look up Caucasus area and found out to be uh, the post-Soviet states of Georgia and Armenia. Chapuis' description goes on to state, and I quote this from their website, these, stock, quote, these stocks are then hand-covered, uh, excuse me, can't even read, these stocks are then hand-carved and fitted to each gun by the stock makers who finish the stocks by hand-rubbing many coats of oil to produce uh, virtually a waterproof finish that reveals the extraordinary contrast and textures of the unique wood selected, close quote. I have one Texas friend who owns and uses a gun identical to this. I think it has a Leopold 1.5 to 5 by 20 scope on it instead of the scope like this one, but he has made several trips to Africa and shot two big game Cape Buffalo, Cape Buffalo with his 470, and he loves the rifle. He sent me photos of his kills with his rifle leaning up against them. But it was my friend in Oklahoma, George Caswell, who owns Champlin Firearms, who convinced me about these Chapuis doubles. George told me the following, 
and later wrote a version of it in one of his ads. This was specifically about a Chapuis double rifle and 470 Nitro Express. George, George's words in, are, and I quote, The best tuft current double in, is the great 470 Nitro Express. Champlin Firearms has handled more double rifles than any dealer in the world, and we feel this is the best buy in any current made serious dangerous game double. We have had every current made box like box lock double rifle in our shop, have shot them all, worked on all, had all of them apart, and we know for a fact that you can't buy a better one for the money than a Chapuy. We hunt with and shoot a lot of double rifles. We flat know this is one tough, attractive, high precision, go to Africa and have money left over for a second buffalo type of gun. I challenge you to show me a better current double rifle for the money. Close quote. And that's no boast. George does outfit more double rifles than any other dealer for African safaris. So what's the caliber of this rifle? Uh, this rifle is chambered in 470 Nitro Express. It's a round designed in 1900 by Joseph Lang, a London gunmaker. <clears throat> More about the cartridge in a minute. Since I've been watching uh, the Chapuis models over the years, they've changed the model titles of their double rifles several times. This particular model was marketed as the Chapuis Safari Express, and the model name is inscribed on the rib. So the first thing I'm thinking is, how bad does this thing kick? Well, uh, I have shot this rifle, and surprisingly, it didn't it didn't kick that bad. And the reason I say surprisingly is because I've had two really bad experiences with big bore recoil. Um, the biggest thing I'd ever shot before the big bores was my 338 Winchester Magnum, and just taking that out to the range and sighting it in was kind of punishing. Uh, the next thing was a 416 Rigby and again I took that out to the range to sight it in and about four rounds were just were bruising every one even the first round. Then in the last episode I told about my 505 Gibbs that was a Heim rifle that I had reboard to 505 Gibbs. When I took that to our club out to the club we only have one range for 50 caliber uh, shooting and uh, this 200 yard range. It was a Saturday and there were a lot of people there. Quite, it was busy. Everybody wearing eye and ear and eye uh, protection like they're supposed to. When I fired that gun, it sounded like a kaboom. A cannon went off. It was uh, so loud. And of course, there was a metal roof over the range. I think that echoed part of it. I uh, felt like Muhammad Ali had hit me in the shoulder. <laughs> And as I, I just rubbing my shoulder, turned around and looked at everybody, all eyes were on me. And I, I was like, what in the heck is that? And uh, even with their ear protection, they were just, it was so much louder than everything else. But, uh, and I've been, I've been kicked by two horses in my lifetime. And that, that experience is very similar. It's just like that big horse just kicked me in the shoulder. And I shot... I shoot 100 rounds of 12-gauge uh, ammo in a couple hours when I'm shooting sporting clays and trap, and it's a different thing. I don't, they don't bother me at all. <clears throat> but I've been told if, you, if I had put a sandbag between the butt of that gun and my shoulder, um, that it would have absorbed a lot of the recoil. Mm -hmm. I don't know how. I've not, never done that. I may try it sometime, but it seems like that would play heck with the length of pull. Uh, and I know from my own experience in the in the in the field when you're hunting, your adrenaline is up, and that makes a difference. Uh, but uh, enough about that mother kicker. This guy here just wasn't uh, n n anything like that. In fact, I would compare it more to my 338 as far as the way it felt. And maybe it's bad memory, or maybe it's uh, I was overcompensating. I don't know, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't bad at all. Well, if it comes to me shooting one of these, I think I'm going to have to pass. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Ah. Holy crock.
Once was enough. Let's look at the metalwork first. As you can see, the action components are polished with what they call, what they call a coin finish. This is a, a finish of, of the receiver, the top tang, top lever, trigger guard, and the lower tang. Uh, also the pistol grip cap and the forearm escutcheon and the forearm release. I've been told that a true coin finish is just case hardening with the colors polished off. We covered case hardening in our last episode too. The result uh, often resembles stainless steel. And this rifle has nearly full coverage hand engraving in the arabesque style by a master engraver, Ivan Thierry, Yvonne Thierry. Uh, the back of the action where the wood and the action meet is often a straight vertical line of wood to metal. When it's not a straight line, as in <clears throat> at that connection, it's called a fancy back. And there are different names for them. Uh, this one is referred to as a scalloped back, found only on the best guns, as a perfect wood to metal fits hard to achieve. After <clears throat> another important metal feature about uh, that I should point out about this big double is the bolstered frame. This is heavy uh, metal reinforcement which widens the receiver and extends up to join at the fences. This additional reinforcement is needed on big bore double rifles and it's rarely found on shotguns, although I once owned a greener Royal shotgun with the bolstered frame. I'm going to pick up the rifle, uh, cover, cover some more details here. Uh, first, the outward metal features. The Anson and Dealey forearm release and a scushion are engraved and coin finished. As I said, the trigger guard has a rolled edge for the right-handed shooter. The lower tang is extended to the pistol grip uh, It's fastened with three screws, which is a stronger arrangement than you see on most guns. The pistol grip cap has a trap door uh, for an alternate front sight, but this one's empty. And on the toe line uh, is a silver metal oval that's vacant for the uh, initials uh, or the monogram of the owner. Two other metal parts are the sling eyes made to fit popular standard sling swivels like Uncle Mike's or several other brands. The front one's mounted on the uh, underside of the rib and between the barrels and the rear one's mounted <coughs> nicely uh, on the toe line between, centered between the oval and the butt. This rifle has 23 and 5 8 inch rifle barrels with an engraved quarter rib uh, for the rear sights and the multiple leaf uh, it's called an express rear sight. It has a fixed leaf for close point of aim and uh, there are three folding leaves sighted for 100, 150, and 200 yards and each one are so inscribed. The front sight is a small silver bead locked in with a set screw which is unusual on a dovetail base with a raised front ramp which is matted on the top surface. You'll see some close-ups of this. Interestingly enough, and unusual for most guns, there's a small protrusion of metal at the muzzle between the barrels uh, to protect the crowns of the bores should the muzzles come in contact with concrete sidewalk or some other such harmful surface. Mechanically, this has two triggers. <clears throat> And the barrels are automatic ejector barrels, which mean the shells once fired are ejected or kicked out of the gun when it's opened. When they're not fired, the cartridges are simply set up uh, to be plucked out by hand. I'm going to demonstrate that and uh, shoot one of the barrels to open the action. Make sure it's safe. What's in here are snap caps, live ammo down there on the table. Close the action, pull the trigger, it was the front trigger, it would be the right barrel, and when I open it, be careful here, it pops out. It presumes the other side has not been fired, well this one has. 
Uh, the safety is located on the top tang behind the top opening lever, which is pretty traditional. It's manual, though not automatic, which is preferred type of safety on a dangerous game rifle. If you have fired both shots and a wounded animal turns to charge, you need to eject the empty cartridges, which will fly out of the way. Uh, and then you need to reload two cartridges quickly, close the action, and you want to be ready to fire. Under pressure, you don't want to have to think about taking the safety off, which would uh, also require an additional step. Another important mechanical feature are the bush strikers. We'll see, you'll see a close-up of those. <clears throat> there, these allow easy access for, access for firing pin repair or replacement. Bush strikers indicate a very high quality gun. We'll show a close up of those in a moment. Now let's turn our attention to the wood. I really like the wood on this one. I, I And so do I. Because the first thing I notice is the overall impression of the wood. That's truly a beautiful gun. It has fancy grain, dense dark walnut with strong figure, reminiscent uh, to me of what we've seen on uh, Holland and Holland rifles. And the shape of the stock feels perfect as the gun comes to the shoulder uh, with sights on target. And looking at the design, the comb is a classic comb. It has, not, doesn't have a Monte Carlo, yet it's high enough to, to align the eye with the scope or with iron sights when the scope is removed. And the comb, uh, the comb is unusual and that it has a shallow flute on the uh, right side, but not on the left. You can, I don't believe you can see that. On, <clears throat> on the left, there, uh, there's also a cheek piece, and it's surrounded by an artistically contoured bead or shadow line. I'm trying to get that around here to see. Um, the right side of the pistol grip, grip has a ray enlarged area called a palm swell. So there are three things that define this rifle for the right-handed shooter. The left side cheek piece, the right grip palm swell, and the rolled trigger guard uh, for the right hand. The forearm is wide and wraps around the barrels, which is called a beaver tail forearm. This, uh, because of the way it looks, like a beaver tail. The checkering is hand checkering, and it's executed uh, flawlessly. The points of the diamonds are crisp and still sharp to the touch, and there's no diamonds missing. On the pistol grip, there are two panels, each ending with a three-point pattern, and there are no teardrops, which would be right here. We'll cover that, that in another episode. Forearm checkering is generous, a four-point pattern, and it meets at two intersections here here on the underside, leaving a nice island of wood, uncheckered wood, um, showing its fancy figure surrounding the escutcheon in the forearm relief. The tip or nose of the forearm is aesthetically rounded. The wood to metal fit is nicely done, but we would describe it as uh, the wood is proud, which means it's uh, higher than the metal by a very minute fraction. And it's done so well that, I mean, it's evenly all over every location would indicate to me it was designed that way. Mm -hmm. Maybe to allow for shrinkage over 100 years, who knows. The butt of the stock has a leather-covered recoil pad. And the final finish of the wood is hand-polished, called uh, French polish on oil finish. It's hand-rubbed. And uh, finally, there's one last significant feature of this rifle to cover, and that's the type of scope, and even more importantly, the type of scope mount, both of which separate this rifle significantly <clears throat> in value from those that don't have these features. The scope is a very high-end Austrian-made Kalis model, Helios C 1.1 to 4 by 24 with 30 millimeter diameter tube, not the one inch tube, and the mounts are the renowned <clears throat> German claw mounts that are quick detachable, and I like to say very quick detachable, which are costly, and even more costly, to have installed properly by the few individuals that uh, 
know what they're doing. When they're installed correctly, after dismounting and then remounting, this system is one of the best for enabling the scope to return to, to zero. Let me show you how that works. I pull back the two buttons of the rear base. On this one, I have to raise the, these are called uh, Butler Creek scope covers. When I raise the front of it, I can, I have the freedom to move off, the front one off. Putting it back on, and just put the front feet back in the front base and go right back down until it clicks and it's back to a perfect zero. Well, that looks easy enough. Yes, it's easy and uh, which translates into being quick to remove and reinstall and yet it re retains its accuracy after removal. The rifle's length of pull from the front trigger to the butt is 14 and a half inches and it's a heavy gun. It weighs 11 pounds, 8 ounces without, uh, with, uh, without scope and with scope 12 pounds, 12 ounces. That's a weight the shooter will appreciate when subjected to its recoil. And now I'm going to disassemble the gun. Take the scope off first. Remove the uh, forearm by releasing the Amson Dealey forearm release. And this one's particularly hard, more so than a typical shotgun. And set, let the barrels fall to 45 degrees. And that frees up the uh, action and the barrels. Now let's, we're going to take these over to the sideboard and examine <clears throat> the disassembled parts. This rifle comes with the maker's leather case that includes a leather sling and the actual maker's target showing the barrels are regulated at 50 uh, meters by serial number. The case has a compartment for the scope. I want to pick up the receiver here. Looking at the receiver first, there is a button on the breech face that when the uh, top lever is pushed over too far to the right, you can push this button and it lets the top lever go back to center. The bush strikers are clearly visible now. When we move the top lever to the right, you can see the locking bolt. This lock locks into the lugs on the barrel flats and it locks up the action. Inside on the bottom of the receiver, we see the serial number 40571. Looking at the barrels, we see the automatic ejectors and under those the big locking lug for the locking bolt on the receiver. This, this protrusion on the bottom of the barrels is called the barrel locking block. At the front end you can see two lugs with the semicircle cutouts which match up to the hinge pin in the receiver. Further down the barrel assembly about six inches mounted on the underside of the rib there's a locking lug for the forearm release. Forward of that is an inscription for the distributor, Champlin Firearms, Enid, Oklahoma. For other markings, the serial number appears again on the right side of the barrel flat. The right hinge lug is also inscribed 470 NE, the caliber designation for 470 Nitro Express. The left hinge lug is stamped with a French proof mark. Turning the barrels over now for a top view, the maker's inscription shows where the scope is covering. It reads Express Chapuis Arms France, surrounded by a nicely matted quarter rib. Now looking at the forearm, since this is the uh, beaver tail type, notice the knife edge sides of the wood allowing it to wrap around the barrels in the beaver tail forearm style. This workmanship is impressive. The metal at the back end of the forearm that fits into the action is called the forearm iron. The two little parts that stick out in the center of this are the forearm iron levers that insert into the action. There are some markings inside on the forearm iron, the serial number again, and the caliber again, 470 NE. To reattach this, reassemble this rifle, 
first pick up action stock, place the barrels in at 45 degrees angle, hold the uh, top lever to the right, and it clicks right back, locks together. Put on the forearm till it clicks, and then we're going to put the scope on and we are going to insert the snap caps. Purpose for that, when not using the gun, the action should not be cocked. Either snap the snap caps or open the gun and take, off, take it off safe and hold both triggers back and close the gun. Let's see whether I can do that. Mm, I can't. What is that? Oh, all right wasn't off safe. Now that works. You don't have the you don't leave the barrel cocked. Uh, now that we've covered all the features, I'd like to point out where this rifle fits in with uh, different terminology that Shapui rifles have used over the last few years. This model of express rifle is one step above the Bruce and the older PH-1. It is between those and the Safari Express EL and the older Jungle models. The features that separate this one from the Bruce model are the leather-covered recoil pad, uh, the significant more stock fi figure into the stock, the inlaid oval in the toe of the, of the, of the rifle stock, and then uh, the pistol grip cap with its trap door. One comment about the cartridge this rifle uh, is chambered for. In Cartridges of the World by Frank C. Barnes, the author addresses the 470 Nitro Express. I'll quote that. It's another extremely popular cartridge which, which was adopted by most makers. It is certainly the most enduring. It has plenty of killing power for many, any of the heavy or dangerous varieties of game. It is one of the best choices in any new double rifle because of ammunition and component availability, close quote. So this great rifle and this great caliber with the addition of the low magnification but variable Austrian scope and the world-class German claw mounts this is one complete package, totally African ready. It is a rifle that anyone with any size pocketbook could be proud of. And I would add that it is a beast of a combination which should, has been built with a single purpose to take down the greatest beast on earth, any, great, any beast on earth. That's it for today. Thank you, Virginia. And thank you, viewers, for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and share with others. And I hope you join us next week for another episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. If you want to get involved with these types of guns, I recommend GunsInternational.com. The owners are great people. I know them and have been using their website since they started. I find it the best source for both buying and selling any great collectible gun.